Okay, so thank you um, for uh, coming to this case study presentation. My name's um, Jess Frawley. I'm from Educational Innovation in the DVC portfolio at the University of Sydney. And I'm co-presenting here today with um, Ting Yue Hu, if you come over. And um, hi. <laughs> and uh, together we're representing staff and student uh, partnership work from that has um, come together over this uh, thing that at the moment we're calling a charter, but um, that has come together from lots of different voices across the university. So we're just spokespeople for a lot of work that a lot of other people have done. So uh, if that works, maybe not, I'll just use that one. Okay. No, ah, there we go. Um, so before we begin, I'd just like to pay my respects to the traditional owners on the land on which we're meeting on today, on Gadigal land, um, and for all of you online, um, all the uh, uh, lands and countries on which you're on. And so what I'd like to do today is just to get you thinking, this was originally going to be a menti activity, but then I realized we're in a nice group, we can sort of do hands up or have a look around the room. And I'd like you to think about what kinds of challenges or work you've addressed through student partnership, okay? And so what I'm gonna get you to do is just have a think, and then I'm gonna get a show of hands. So student engagement work, so student life, student outreach, anyone? Yeah, I've got a few hands around the room. Teaching and learning work. You know, improving curriculum. Okay, another set of hands go up. Um, things like, uh, what about library? Yeah, okay, we've got some library down the front. Um, what about learning spaces, co-design of spaces? Okay, yeah, we've got a few hands going up there. Okay, so what I'm trying to illustrate here is that um, the kinds of things we're tackling are very diverse. And now the next question I'd like you to think about is what are the most important ingredients for making that work? So we talk about student-staff partnership, but what, what makes it work in those different contexts? And so I might just uh, get a hands up from anyone, a few things, if you had to, if you had to say something. Yep. Okay, respect. Thank you, I will segue to that later. Um, at the back, listening, yeah, patience, transparency, excellent, curiosity, which we heard about in the last session, yep, yep, so transparency and the objectives, what is the reward and recognition, yeah, equity, brilliant, lead time, so planning and execution, yeah, Okay, so we're gonna come back to those, but just um, allow a little bit of space around what you've all just said just now. So I'm now gonna hand over and look at one experience of partnership, and I'm gonna hand over to Ting Yue to talk about her experience. Um, hi, so my name is Ting Yue, and I'm a fourth year Bachelor of Education and Bachelor of Science student here at the University of Sydney. Um, and I'm also a student partner, which is why I'm here today to share a bit of my experience, how I ended up as a student partner and what I've sort of gotten out of this experience. So back in second year, um, I had finished all my final year exams and I was feeling bored. So I was like scrolling through my emails and eventually come across an email about a focus group. At the time, I like had no idea or not no idea. Like I knew of the word focus groups, but I didn't really know what it encompassed. But you know what, I was bored and it said I could meet new people and it would give me an Amazon gift card. So I thought, oh, wow, what a great deal. Let me go. Okay. So I go to the focus group and that was sort of my first partnership experience. I wouldn't necessarily call being a focus group participant a student partner. It's more of a like student as consultant, but it definitely kicked off the start like of my student partnership experience because at that focus group, I met Becky, the wonderful Rebecca Denham, which maybe some of you will know, um, who will eventually, eventually email me a year later, nominating me for, how do I click this? Okay. For um, the student partner round table, which was, which we'll go through today um, later in our presentation. Um, 
And this was kind of my first kind of official experience as a student partner, because all of a sudden I was sitting at these tables with staff and with students outside of my own discipline. And we were talking normally. And when I say normally, I mean that there wasn't sort of a hierarchy there, like in the classroom, like I would never go near a staff member. <laughs> I'm too scared to, you know, I perceive them as an authority figure. Um, and, but there we were just kind of just connecting with each other and learning from each other. You know, it's not like a classroom where I'm just learning from a staff member. We were really just learning from each other. And so that was incredibly valuable and it kicked off my student partner experience. Um, eventually I would do two projects as a student partner as part of the strategic education grants. I'm not sure if it, that's, is that a UCID thing or is that like, yeah, yeah it's a UCID thing. Um, and so one of the projects I did was the review of the Green Guide. And that was incredibly valuable because I could provide my perspective as an equity student um, and just really have my voice heard. Um, and so my experiences and suggestions, they were being heard and being translated into something meaningful. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. That's, you know, really valuable. And also I met Jess during the Green Guide. So even better, very valuable experience. Um, but during the other project I did, I ran focus groups, which like probably doesn't blow your mind, but it blows my mind because I started off not knowing pretty much anything about focus groups. And all of a sudden I had autonomy. I had a say in, you know, how we were going to run these focus groups and I was running it on a weekly basis. Um, I ran those focus groups with two wonderful student partners, Heidi and Monica, who aren't here today, unfortunately. Um, and also with Fran Vandenberg, who later became my honours supervisor. And I probably wouldn't have done honours had I not, you know, had that sort of experience and come across the right people. Um, so I would say, you know, I got a lot of things out of this student partner experience. Um, and like autonomy, you know, I felt valued. I felt like I was contributing something meaningful. But I think overall to me, the most important thing were the student staff and student student connections I formed along the way. And so I think the student partner experience means something different to every single staff member and student member, but that's just my experience. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, that was brilliant. So we're gonna then expand on that and think if that was Ting Yue's one experience of partnership, what does that look like around a whole university? Okay, well, you've got in-class teaching, as we heard of, the idea of students as consultants. Is it partnership? It's not quite partnership, but it often feeds into it. We've got student life, grants or projects. We've got peer advisory, which again is, is it partnership or is it not? But it, it often aligns and feeds into that learning spaces. And into all of this, we've got this huge issue of scale at the University of Sydney with 67,000 students, 11,000 staff, um, multiple campuses. We've got these different domains, teaching and learning, student life library. And then we have these different contexts in which this can occur in sort of disciplinary context, portfolios, libraries, and classrooms. And into that sort of network, we also have the unknowns and they may be doing partnership, but not calling it that. So years ago, before I even heard of students as partners, I worked on a co-design initiative in architecture, design and planning, and we never called it that. But goodness me, wouldn't it have been great if we'd have had the language to connect to the other things going on? across the university and the language and the literature and the values and understandings. And so I'm gonna start with this um, provocation. And it's this idea that, you know, students as partners, we talk about it as being collaborative and reciprocal, although not always in the same way. And um, one thing that I learned a lot um, when I was working with um, Lucy Mercer Mapstone to create a Students as Partners Roundtable was this idea that partnership isn't solely the domain of programs and projects that are labeled as such, and that it can happen through good pedagogy and good teaching. Not always, okay? Not just calling something partnership doesn't always mean that it's going to be so, but it can exist. And so 
um, in order to try and understand what does uh, students as partners look like at the University of Sydney. In 2023, um, I led an environment scan and we looked at um, the internal environment and we looked at the external environment. I'll talk about that later. But in the internal environment, we found that um, there was evidence of partnership um, going on across the university in lots and lots of different ways. And um, then there was all this sort of desktop evidence that was sourced. So journal articles, um, blog articles, online references. There was a center for research um, in, I think, in, uh, Curly. I used to um, refer to it as um, of innovation in learning, in learning um, innovations. And they had a special um, interest group devoted to students as partners. So there was lots of sort of historical things that had gone on in that space. Um, but some of the outcomes from that was that the university was highly experienced in students as partners, but it was often siloed and it happening in little places. And then because it was siloed, it was often at risk. So you had brilliant work done in say 2016, and then two staff members who drove that work leave and there's no record of it. So what happens? People reinvent the wheel. And sometimes that's necessary because of our different contextual areas, but sometimes it's the administration of creating contracts in HR and stuff like that. And there is no benefit to having to go through that in isolation all over again. Another thing that happens is you have little shared language across those networks and few systems or resources where people can see see what's going on in a in another corridor in another faculty in another department where there is a lot of experience and so the next provocation is and um i have to thank um ali for introducing me to this lovely paper and it's by cornelius bell bell and dollinger and it's called deterritorializing student voice and partnership in higher education and it's this idea that um we might have our different areas which we work into and oh i've gone too far you've seen the secrets uh bah. okay and this is where the uh let me see whether i can get back which one will work okay well uh not much of a provocation well um but where do these help us because when we're working with student outreach or student life or in a classroom in chemistry or in first year experience there are, there are reasons for us to have contextual knowledge in the room. But at what point do these um, divisions and territories work against us? And so I don't really have an answer for that, but it's just something that I found that this paper was really helpful in thinking about because when we listened to Ting Yue talk about her experience, that was a holistic experience. That wasn't divided. And so you can move from student life and into teaching and learning. And so how do we understand a, an experience of students as partners? Okay. And then I went into the environment scan of the external. Um, and I, uh, I can see several people who are um, reduced to numbers, sadly, on this uh, table in the room here. And I spoke to 18 people across Australia and one person from the University of Cambridge who are all doing or um, students as partners or student partnership in lots of different ways. And um, the sort of big outcomes from this was that for an, a university, we do need some sort of shared definition around what we mean by partnership. We've got to go beyond feedback. Um, the context will dictate implementation. So we need to have variation, that it can become powerful when we have strategic alignment between what we aim to achieve and um, uh, what we're doing on the ground, and then thinking about implementation and resourcing. And so those were the, were the main findings, um, along with just sort of meeting lots of uh, nice people and having good conversations about students as partners. And I think as an area, I will say that it's, a, it's an incredibly um, intellectually and emotionally uh, generous um, place to be. So, um, and then we come up in, when we talk about um, resourcing, you know, you'll find if you're talking in a siloed environment that there are lots of debates about 
should you pay students? Should you not pay students? Does payment undermine partnership? Or if you don't pay, what does that do for equity? And that actually there's a viable spectrum that can allow for unpaid um, student partnership, especially for in-curricular work. So where the partnership is occurring in the classroom. So um, Maria Ishkova, who's online today, she does brilliant partnership work within the way she teaches her students. But that might not be right for everything. And in certain places like projects, we need payment because otherwise it excludes. And then this, the, the big thing is about how we reward and recognize. So um, in terms of facilitating conversations, um, we had a Students as Partners Roundtable that uh, Ting, Yue, Ting Yue and myself were involved in. We had Lucy Mercer Mapstone facilitate that, 90 nominated delegates, 50% staff, 50% students from all schools, faculties and departments. We focused on equity within partnership. And so we had... Um, I think uh, especially having Lucy in in driving some of those conversations, we had a panel, a student staff panel on um, equity. So we were thinking about power dynamics that go beyond the student staff binary. So race and gender, um, socioeconomic class, things like that, and how they shape the dynamics of the partnership experience. And then, um, Ting Yue, do you want to quickly summarize it? Yep. That does work. That one? Yeah. Okay. So um, in order to get the way we created a student partnership charter was that we wanted everyone who was there to get their, their ideas in. So we started off with an individual reflection, which was on a worksheet. It had 10 questions. And the idea was that after you reflected, you extract the two most key ideas for each question onto post-it notes. And then they were there was like butcher's paper placed around the room for each of the 10 questions. And you would put your two ideas onto butcher's note with the corresponding question. This way we get everyone's ideas in. Okay. Um, and then we were kind of split into groups. Uh, you know, the groups had staff and students, and we would discuss and analyze the room's contributions. And then we would categorize them and summarize them. So we ended up with 10 written artifacts. And eventually, we verbally presented them back to the group. Two. And then after that, we had lots of data. Um, so we got a small group of people just to do the analysis on, on that. Um, Maria um, led the qualitative analysis. Maria's online today, um, along with her student Aruna. And um, we then, um, the big thing that came up time and time again, or not, it was the first thing that you said when I asked you what made for good partnership was respect. And it came up in every single question. And so we had one um, core value that then goes into these uh, things that you all just said in your own words um, that make up the principles that we use. And this is like a sort of a way of us sharing our conversations. Oh, and um, sorry, uh, you can actually access it on a bit.ly uh, on the front of the slide. So I'll, I'll make sure we go back to that. And um, as part of the charter, it's very short. Um, the idea is that you have a core value but it translates into principles, but it ultimately has to go into actions because we all know that um, values like Enron had values and uh, famously committed a lot of fraud and ignored those values. So they have to be enacted, but the actions will look different dependent on context. Okay. So, um, or, and um, sometimes role. And then in terms of how signatory works, it's this idea of creating um, technologies that allow us to record all the things that happen because sometimes people may come together in partnership for a project and they may leave. It may not be sustained, but we need to we need to find a way of recording that so it doesn't just disappear into the ether. Okay. And so we're currently working um, on some of how the, the record keeping, especially for our strategic education grants, which are currently going on at the moment. So you can access the charter at that bit.ly right there. Um, and if you're an individual staff or student, you can um, you can click on that and that will help us record what is going on in a very diverse space. And thank you, if there are any questions. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, the advertising of a lot of stuff had a print copy in it. Yeah, I'm thinking about the things that happen in universities, like research and teaching, and then there's something called partnership that we've got, and the desire to make it seamless mm -hmm. is a thing where most of the activities in the university are not seamless. You move around research, it's awkward, it's repetitive, you know, then there's teaching, there's a whole other basket case of thing that works around universities. And I wonder about why we are trying to make partnership into this seamless thing. Mm. Like, and so then I'm wondering about what's the theory of change like? Mm. And I'm, I'm trying to speculate about whether that's even achievable or possible and why it's desirable. Do you think that the this partnership data that is here at Sydney is also about that kind of thing, of trying to think about the student at the centre and the way they move through an institution because we don't want them to experience mm -hmm. any inconvenience whatsoever because everything should be joined up, articulated, mm -hmm. so that everything is smooth. I think it's a great point because I think there is productive disruption and there's productive discomfort. I think the main, I think, when we came together at the round table, the main thought was on focusing on how do we connect across the university and have a way of talking about what we're doing without going into the arts and social sciences established program and saying, well, you're going to do it this way because they know, they know what they're doing or the faculties who have been doing it in their own way with their own, like, I don't think it's a sort of top-down control mechanism, but I think it can be a tool for saying, I know when you talk about partnership, this, I, I know what you're referring to, which is, I think, a way we can, we can have conversations. Um, mm. It's just this sort of action, it's about impact, it's the quality of what, what happens in the partnership and how that so, so we have, have yeah, so we have that as a recording mechanism on the project signatory, and then we can, we're still working out, well, how, if I've just done a strategic education grant and things didn't work, where does that go? Because you might not want that to be <laughs> distributed large and wide, but you also want to share, I did this and it, it didn't, it didn't work. So it's just, yeah, a way of recording what we're doing and talking about it because I think siloed practice, eh, yeah, we, you know, you have people, like we, we've got people who have spent ages thinking about how to set up a student contract and you think, well, that's not, how, yeah, that's not a useful, you know, spend time thinking about how you use partnership to tackle third year chemistry learning. Spend, that's where you want your contextual specifics to to ring out so but this is just a start a conversation conversation starter I don't think it's um it's everything it's just um a group of people coming together and saying this is what we what, what we want or what we we find important okay to allow the freedom to explore that how each individual wants to or each whatever area you work in. But I think shared language is really important because otherwise when someone says to me, it's a bit of a like a task for us, but also it just also allows things like that kind of very transactional um, opportunity to ask students something to be grounded in partnership and I think that's really valuable. And I, I think if I was thinking about it in a sort of quadrant in my mind, I'd say you've got things that are labeled as partnership and are partnership. You've got things that are labeled as partnership and are not partnership, um, except in a superficial way on the surface, I've written a paper or something. Um, you might have stuff that's not labeled as partnership, but is doing something that with a shared language could be better shared or connected to theories or pedagogies or a body of research and, and community that is around that. Um, so I, th I think it's about like, and then you've got people who are not doing it, but might want to. And if there's no language 
or we're all talking about different things, then that's hard. So it's only just been made, so I, I wouldn't really know. But um, uh, but I mean, we did have a discussion around what, like, a, a lot of that was student led around. Well, do you want to use this, the university branding, or do you want to have, uh, you know, something that a student has drawn? And they, um, the thoughts from students were that they wanted to tap into the authority of the university brand in terms of the document. So they wanted to buy in because it carries a power and, and they, were, they were cognizant of that. And, but equally it's, it's quite a short document. So it's not reams of paper, it's not a huge framework and everyone's got their name, everyone on that round table, bar a few who didn't sign in on the day, who will be out in version two, have their names listed on that. And there was a lot of pride from students in seeing that their conversations and contributions could be put in something with, you know, with that authority behind it. And they, they were, they, the students were, were really thrilled to be involved in talking about that. so in terms of historical records i'm just saying you know you can go and do a good you can do a public search for things that have happened often it's been teams of students and academics who have published a paper together back in medicine and health years ago, or um, Ty and Amani did some brilliant work around cultural competence that was part of one strategic wave. And you can record, you can record those things so that they sit in, so that you have visibility of it, because otherwise you have to search for them again and again. I don't really, I, I'm not sure I, I would know on how, um, yeah, on how to answer the question around um, honey or student involvement in that. Thank you again. I have a question for you. Um, and whatever you mean, you've got going on, but you're no longer bored. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to think about how we can, um, are we only waiting until students are bored? <laughs> you know, engagement because they, they think so time for and you know, so many different priorities to, to engage them in the in the outset. So have you had any other and I love how it's um one experience um cascading mm -hmm. to others mm -hmm. and you've got holistic experience in the speaking of it because there's all so many variations of what partnership look feels like for you. But yeah, um how do I get how can we sort of connect with students because we've got to do that order? <laughs> or how do, how do I time our promotion or, or um, okay. uh, engagement of students? Or, you know, at the right yeah. time? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think um, it varies from student to student. So, for example, the way the strategic education grants run is that Becky sends out emails to the student partners and the student, like, if a student wants to apply, then they apply. And when I was applying for these projects, the main thing I was looking at was time. It was like, I, I, cause I do education. I go on practice into schools and stuff. I don't exactly have the time to, you know, just come in and do a student partner project. So I, you know, I always look for the projects that suit my timetable the best. And I think it would vary from student to student. I think it's just making this very clear and very visible to students would probably be really helpful. And you would probably find a very, um, unique combination of students coming in to your project. And I think it's, again, goes back to the context, like who are they intersecting with at what, in what capacity? So, you know, if they're doing, you know, a teaching and learning um, student partnership initiative, 
in first year design, they'll be approaching their, th they'll be very targeted in who they approach, but with student employment opportunities that is looked after by um, student life part of the portfolio, it's going to be different. It's not going to be just targeted to third year design students, but so it's going to vary, I think. Okay, I we're being called off. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.